my, <clears throat> I'm asked to fill in, and I stand before people, I realize the awesome responsibility I, that upon me to bring to you the Word of God. And when I do that, <clears throat> I usually, if not always, <clears throat> Select something that's good for me. Because I figure if I need it, you need it. And it's my attempt, uh, attempt to be loving, to be kind, and also to be encouraging. It's our duty as children of God to try to help each other to go to heaven. Now we'll be using some scripture that pertains to our lesson this morning. You'll probably not be able to, to keep up or turn to the scriptures, but I want to ask you to write down the scriptures that I refer to and read them for two purposes. Number one, I want you to check and see if what I have to say is in harmony with the Word of God. And if it's not, you'll do me a favor by bringing to my attention where I've missed it. <clears throat> Secondly, I'm such a firm believer in the Scripture that if you will do that, it will help you in facing the problems and difficulties we face in life. Perhaps one of the most difficult things that for people to face is to face the facts. And that's the subject of our lesson today. A parent may desire that their child make perfect grades in school. They may not face the fact that the child is not capable of making perfect grades. They may re reject the fact that they are not capable and blame the teacher. A father may have a desire to see his son play quarterback for the high school team, not realizing his son is not really that good. He may not accept the fact and blame the coach. In this sermon, I want to think about some facts that we all must face. Yes, I know that it's difficult for us to accept the fact that we're not as young as it used, we used to be. We're not as strong. There are things that we used to could do we can't do anymore. Some of us are f slow learners in this regard. And I know that it would be difficult for us to face the fact, but there are real facts I want to talk to you about. And I believe the sooner that we realize these facts, the better we will be. Fact number one, the devil wants you to be lost in hell for eternity. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about seeking whom he may devour. First Peter 5 and 8. James, in his book, tells us how to overcome. Submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James chapter 4 and verse 7. But Peter said to Ananias, and I asked, why has 
Satan fills your heart. While you had the land, was it not yours? You haven't lied, but to the Holy Spirit of God. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3. The Apostle Paul gives warning to the church at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 11, lest Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Remember that the devil has many devices. He has centuries of experience from the Garden of Eden until today. And those devices is going to be directed at you at your weakest point. And this is a fact that we must re realize. Paul faced this problem when the adversaries of Paul and Christianity was trying to deny Paul's apostleship to the Corinthians church. And he says, such are false prophets, deceitful workers, and no marvel. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Whose end shall be destruction according to their works. First, Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 15. The sad part about it, in fact, number two, is the devil will get his way in most cases. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Luke records it a little differently. Instead of saying enter the straight gate, he says strive to enter the straight gate. That shows us conclusively that it's difficult to live the Christian life. But it's a necessity if we're going to heaven. We have time here and the purpose here in living to prepare ourselves for the home of the soul that God has prepared for us. This is true that the majority of people are going to be lost simply because we allow him to. No, you're not. That so many of us, no, you're not to, that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrineness, doctrine, being then made free. Notice it. You became the servants of righteousness. That's our duty as children of God is to serve, not to be served. Adam and Eve were driven from the garden because they chose to do Satan's bidding. If you're lost, you have no one to blame but yourself. You may blame others. And it's true that some may lead you in the wrong direction. But you remember this, you have a choice. I have a choice.
for me you must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an answer to the deeds done in the body according to that which we have done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Fact number three. And this is a good fact. God wants to forgive you of your sins. That's been God's purpose and plan since the fall of man in the garden. To fall in Israel, God said through the prophets, Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be red. Though your sins be red like crimson, they will be white as snow. If we reason with the scripture, the scripture will convince us of the direction our lives should go. To love our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and all of our mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The prophet Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 31 and verse 11, he was a prophet of God, a young man, estimated to be about 32 years old. God had used Ezekiel as a prophet to try to warn and to get the people to turn around from the sinful ways of which he were going. God said to Ezekiel, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Turn, turn you, and live. Why will you die, O Israel? They were in Babylonian captivity because they had forsaken the Lord. They had devoted themselves to to spiritual adultery by serving wood and stone, idols. You notice what he said? Turn, turn ye twice, he said turn. What is that? What does it mean to turn? It means to repent, change your conduct, change the way you live. That's what repentance is all about. Is turning from our way unto God's way and doing what God would have us to do. 2 Timothy 2 4 says, God will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. If we have a knowledge of the truth, we'll see how small we are, how weak we are, and how we need the strength of God to live the Christian life. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Second Peter chapter three and verse nine. Fact number four, living righteously is never easy. We need to get that. We need to understand that in the beginning. And as we teach people, we need to teach them it's not going to be easy. Governor Felix of Caesarea thought it would be but convenient to be a Christian. 
no difficulty, no hardship. To Paul, he said, Paul, go thy way. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for you. Well, you know what? A convenient season never came. It never will. We must make an effort in order to please God. Doing right sometimes causes a problem. In preparing this lesson, <clears throat> I have thought about back over many years, <clears throat> tried to number the people that have had so much pressure put on them by the family because they left their father's religion that I've taught. They couldn't stand the pressure and they fell away. Jesus knew that. In fact, he says in Matthew 10, 34 through 37, think not that I come to bring peace on the earth. <clears throat> I, not, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I am come to set a man against his father and the father against the son, the mother against the daughter, and the mother-in-law against the father-in-law. How's he going to do that? That's found in Matthew 10, 37, and 30, 34 through 37. Now, how's he going to do that? Did Jesus come intentionally to set families apart? <clears throat> no, he didn't. He came with the truth. He said, no, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It will make those free who accept it, abide by it, and live it in their lives. And verse 6, uh, John eight thirty one, he says to those that believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice what he said to his disciples. He's going to give them a commission after his resurrection of the dead to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But he gave them a warning. He said, they shall put you out of the synagogue. They will kill you. And they will think that they do God a service because they take your life. It is easier to live the Christian life if we choose our companions wisely. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Know you not that evil communications or associations corrupt good morals. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Jesus is letting us know there's a burden to bear. He goes on to say, you got to take up your cross daily and follow me. Yes, it's going to be a burden. But he's going to help us bear that burden. 
and the more we bear that burden, the easier it gets to bear it. The joy we experience because we bear up under that burden. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Luke 9 and verse 23. Hard times that we face as a Christian will help us to grow in measure. James tells us, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. When he is tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. James 1 and verse 13. We sang a song a couple of weeks ago and on Wednesday night. I believe Brother Milam led it. That song was, Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you some other to win. That's a fact. That's true. Many of you, no doubt, have experienced that. No doubt, hell will be populated with people who plan to do right when it's convenient, when it's easy. No one ever successfully lives a Christian life without sacrifice. Paul says to the Romans, therefore, I beseech you, brother, therefore, that you present your bodies and live in sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. There are three things that we need to remember. It's always right to do right. That's not to say that bad things do not come because you do right sometimes. Second, we need to remember it's always wrong to do wrong. And that's not to say that some good may come out of doing wrong. But be sure your sins will find you out. And number three, God's word is always the standard of right and wrong. And I wasn't looking close enough at my notes, but I'm going to go back and uh, cover number five that I just got over. Fact number four is this. Obey, obedience to God is always right. Right and wrong are not determined by what appeals to the flesh. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for the food and desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave to her husband also, and he did eat. Right and wrong is not what merely seems right to human concepts. Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ways thereof are the ways of death. Right and wrong is not, does not, what is appealing to uh, what is right or wrong is not determined by the conscience. 
I've had people to say to me, well, just to follow your conscience and you'll be all right. Your conscience was never given as a guide. It's a reminder if you do wrong. If you talk right and do wrong, it's going to it's gonna get, get you. The Apostle Paul made that clear when he was defending himself before the council against false charges. He said, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I can't say that. Can you say that? That you have lived in all good conscience before God till this day? Look at the con and in contrast the difference in Saul of Tarsus and Paul the apostle of Jesus Christ. Here's who the Saul of Tarsus was. He was an educated man, a zealous man, a religious man, and he killed Christians. He forced them to blaspheme and renounce their Christianity. He even gave his voice to those who were put to death because of the Christian. But when he became a Christian, God changed his name from Saul to Paul and gave him a commission to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. What did he do? He did more than all the other apostles combined as far as the scripture records for us. Fourteen books he wrote. But he thought he was doing what God wanted him to do. Right and wrong are not determined by the majority. Well, everybody's doing it. Well, the majority's wrong. If it were determined by the majority, then Noah was wrong. If right and wrong is determined, then the prophets in the Old Testament are wrong. So they were Jesus and the apostles. We've already noticed Matthew 7, 13 and 14 where Jesus said the majority is not going to be saved. They're going to go the broad way. Right and wrong is not determined by parents and relatives. Jesus said, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that followeth not after me is not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 10, verses number 37 and 38. Right and wrong is not determined by religious leaders. And that include members of the church. That's why I asked you to check behind me. I want you to believe what you believe because it comes from Jesus, not because it comes from me. I'm a human. I'm, I can make mistakes. The Bible is always right. We're given warning. The Apostle Paul gave a warning to the church at Ephesus in Acts 20, verses 28 through 30. He said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, you elders, you leaders, speaking 
strange or diverse things to draw disciples after them. Therefore, watch. Each of us have the responsibility to watch. Not only watch that we're not swallowing something just because brother so-and-so said it, but swallow it because God said it in his word. Appreciate the fact that God has given us his word. What is the standard of right and wrong? Do you realize the majority of college-age students do not believe that there is a standard? Situation ethics. What is the standard? Was it the standard of right and wrong in the Garden of Eden? Was it absolute? What about the standard of Lot and his family? When God determined to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for their sins. The angel told them to hasten and get out. They didn't want to get out quick enough. The angel got Lot with one hand and got his wife with the others. In verse 17, he said, look not behind you. We read on down to verse 26. It says, and his wife looked behind him. That is, look behind the angel. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. So I asked you, Is there a standard? Was there a standard in the case of Lot? What was the standard in Le uh, Leviticus chapter 1 and two, chapter 10 verses 1 and 2? <clears throat> two priests, the sons of Aaron, took each of them their censer and put fire their own which God had not commanded. And fire came from heaven and destroyed them. Destroyed them. Was the standard absolute? God's word is absolute. The standard of right and wrong. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word as one that judges him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. In conclusion, the th last fact I will mention is one we all know need to face. No one here is promised tomorrow. Yesterday is gone. It's gone forever. That's why if you're here today and not a Christian, you ought to obey the gospel today because you don't have tomorrow. It's very simple. It hadn't changed since the day the church was started. It's not going to change till the end of time. Believe in God. Believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And he died for you. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him. And be baptized for the remission of sins. If you've tried to hold on to the world and hold on to Christ, it's an impossibility. You need to repent of that. 
And if you need to come, make your life right with God. Do so now, as together we stand and sing.